G'day, I'm Russell Coit and this is my backyard, the Aussie Outback. Tonight we're heading up north to the Red Centre to catch up with some old mates for their annual cattle muster. So what are we waiting for? Let's get cracking on another all Aussie adventure. Come on, girl. White brown lad, seen a thing or two. From Great Out Back on the beaten track, let me share it now with you. All Aussie adventures, pack up your swag, let's go. All Aussie adventures. All Aussie adventures, time to hit the road. The Red Centre of Australia. A land as old as time and almost as timeless. If you ask me, it's a top part of the world. And what better way to check it out than flat chat? <laughs> a couple of old mates needed a favour. Could I help them out on their annual cattle muster? The problem was, it would mean covering 800 miles in just a couple of days. But when it comes to lending a hand to a man on the land, an outback bloke like me just can't say no. The trip would take me through some pretty special country. Tell you what, sure is hot. Sure is hot. Very, very hot indeed. We're just heading up into Simpson Desert, one of the biggest and driest deserts in the world. After that, it's the Alice. Alice Springs, still a day to drive away, but uh, there's only one thing for it, that's to keep on moving. My journey would take me north into northern Australia, then over the border into the south of the Northern Territory, and further west, just northeast, the southeastern border of Western Australia. It's little wonder this country took so long to explore and settle. Just about every expedition was defeated by huge distances, fierce heat, and of course, lack of food. What the early European explorers and pioneers didn't realise is that in the Australian outback, there's plenty of food to be found, you just have to know where to find it. Someone who knows more about bush tucker than anyone I know is an old mate of mine by the name of Greg Stewart. Let's go meet him now. Good day, Greg. Yeah. Yeah, good to see you again, mate. How are you? Well, mate, uh, we're looking for a bit of bush tucker. You know, uh, a lot of people, you know, they look out there and they think to themselves, just normal old bushland. But to blokes like you, it's an absolute supermarket of food out there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You reckon we could uh, go out and have a bit of a look around for some bush tucker? Okay, yep. Uh, just before we go, mate, uh, I'm on a seafood diet. Oh. Right. If I see food, I, I eat it. Right. Finding bush tucker is not always easy, and it takes a skilled guide like Stewie to recognise the telltale signs that something edible is nearby. <sighs> Aboriginal people have an uncanny ability to spot food. Where you or I might be staring at blank landscape, their eyes can spot life-saving bush tucker. What's this little berry? Is a little berry here? No, I can't. No? No. Even though it was proving a little difficult to find our dinner, it was a marvellous opportunity to see some very special country. Yeah, we could do something with that. No. Maybe we could boil it up or something, make it into a stew or a, or a tea. No? No. Okay. The reality is, Greg, that this whole area is uh, absolutely teeming with bush tucker. What sort of things would we find around here? Uh, wild onions. Wild onions? Yeah. Well, any, would there be any onions around here now? No, we had a bit, bit of a rain, won't find any now. Won't find any now, yeah. yeah uh, okay. Wild bananas. Bananas? Yeah. Oh, what, uh, little sort of... Uh, Green, little, yeah. Little, little bananas. bananas. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of those around here, is there? Yeah. At any at the moment? No, they no. come from uh, just about summertime. Summertime, yeah. Yep. What, what could we uh, find, like, today, actually, now? Oh. Out here. Time to hit the road. It was the tail end of the wet and there was still a lot of water lying around. During the wet, a lot of tracks up this way get washed out. The only way to get around is to avoid travelling. But it would take more than a few puddles to stop a country kid from getting to a mate's muster. 
Of course, with all that water, the fish were bound to be on the bite. It's amazing what you'll catch in these freshwater billabongs. Perch, yellow belly. Looks like we've got ourselves a bit of a snag here, though. Might even catch ourselves a blackfish for dinner. <laughs> oh! Time to hit the road. Not that you find too many roads in this part of the world. I was still a few days south of Alice, smack in the middle of the Simpson Desert. Lucky thing, I knew a few shortcuts which would cut the journey a little shorter. But about 200 clicks south of Alice, I stumbled across a bloke in need of some help. It amazes me the people who think they can tackle the outback without the right vehicle or equipment. This bloke was going nowhere fast. Bombed up to the outside. Lucky I always come prepared. This is a power jack or bullback. It's designed for use in soft desert sand where a conventional jack would just dig in and fall. A few diesel fumes and this bloke should be on his way. first rays of dawn began to dawn, the Aussie bush comes alive. Brightly coloured parrots, the magnificent brown sparrow, and the majestic bullet. But the animals weren't the only things waking up. Just because you're out in the bush doesn't mean you can't enjoy some of the creature comforts. What we got here is a bush shower. Now I filled it up with warm water, it's simply just a matter of turning that and I get a beautiful warm shower. Okay. Just drop the towel and we're ready to go. But enough of the creature comforts. It was time for this coit to get moving. However, packing the car a few moments later, it turned out I wasn't exactly alone. It's amazing what happens when you park your car out in the outback. You get little visitors. Have a look at this. That's an echidna. And what's happened is he's gone for a bit of a walk, found the car here and thought to himself, that's some very nice shade. He probably thinks I'm a big scary animal now because he can hear me talking and he's digging himself in nice and deep. Now these quills here are very sharp, so there's no way, even if I wanted to, I could get at him. A fascinating animal, animal, certainly beautiful as well. And you know what else I like? You don't have to buy a ticket to a zoo to see an animal in its natural habitat. And the great thing is, there's plenty more up ahead. Time to hit the road. I had a muster to help out with and only a few days to get there. Tell you what, the mornings can be cold up this way. Once the sun comes up, it doesn't take long for the mercury to do the same. Come up. The first white fella to make it into these parts came through in 1862. A bloke by the name of John McDool Stewart. He was attempting to cross the country from south to north. In his path, huge tracts of desert, massive sand dunes and dense, impenetrable spinifex. To make matters worse, not far into the journey, Stewart's party ran into a fierce tribe of local Aborigines. The battle was bloody. And by the time Stewart escaped, his party was dead. He was forced to stagger on, lost, out of food, totally alone. Of course, long before white man came through here, the place was inhabited by black men. What you're looking at here in the sandstone are the Ueninga rock carvings. Ueninga rock carvings. And they've been here for between 1,000 and 5,000 years. It's a long time. Beautiful, aren't they? Yeah. 
I never pass through this country without paying a visit to my Aboriginal mates, where I'm often asked to help out with a corroborate. The Aboriginal legends surrounding the outback are fascinating to hear, and I'm always fascinated to hear them. Ted, can you ask Jeff to tell us a bit about the history of the local area? Yeah, <laughs> What did he say? Better get moving. I don't normally like sealed roads, but if I was going to make that muster, I'd have to get back on the bitumen. This is the Stewart Highway, which stretches 2,708 kilometres from the south of Australia to the north, and then back again. Those cows on the side of the road told me one thing. I was getting closer to my destination. Yep, it was cattle country and they breed them big up this way, and that's no bull. But seriously, these stock belong to an old mate of mine by the name of Sal Hearn, who owns one of the top beef cattle properties in the Territory. There's no way I could go past without dropping in for a cuppa. G'day mate, how are you? Yeah, good thanks mate. Good to see you again. Yeah. You well? Yeah, good thanks. Yeah, yeah how are things going out here? Good, we've had a bit of rain, so... Have you? Yeah, yeah. it looks like it's greened up. I'll tell you what, the uh, road's a bit bumpy, more bumps than a paddock full of camels. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's terrible at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, good. Oh. Tea? Tea? Oh, would you like a cup of tea, mate? Oh, that'd be lovely, thanks oh, mate. Great. Yeah, Come on great. In. It was good catching up with Sal for a yarn. Well, I certainly needed that. Yeah, it's good. All too soon, it was time for me to get to the rock. A lot of country up this way is privately owned. But if you do the right thing and ask permission to cross their land, you'll find Aussies rarely say no. people find outback driving dull. The reality is, it's a top part of the world. And keep your eyes open, you can see it. Oh. Oh. All Aussie adventures, time to hit the road. Dawn and I was on the road again, heading north through the Simpson on my way to that cattle muster. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that deserts are barren places, but there's plenty of wildlife to be found out here if you know where to look. Birds, wild camels, and of course ants. But enough sightseeing, by now I only had 18 hours left, and as each hour passed, there was one less. No doubt about it, deserts can be dangerous places. A lot of people have made mistakes out here and paid the ultimate penalty. Others have actually done it. But even with years of experience like me, things can still go wrong. Yep, it's finally happened. We're broken down. The outback certainly takes its toll on these vehicles. This is a classic survival situation. Do the wrong thing and you'll probably perish. Do the right thing and you'll probably survive. Step one, do not leave the vehicle. People often make that mistake and they perish within a couple of days. Remember, the vehicle is the safest place to be. Step two is to let someone know where you are. Now I'm going to go to channel five, the emergency channel, and tell the Royal Flying Doctor Service my location. Uh, this is all Aussie Traveller requesting emergency contact. Do you read over? <laughs> 